Thank you everybody for being here. Um, I'm Katie Sullivan. Tom Sullivan was my husband. Um, and today is the first time that I will be sharing the story of what happened to Tom from my perspective. So thank you for listening. <clears throat> um, in just over three months, it will be the fourth anniversary of my husband's death. Our daughter Ava had just turned three when Tom died and she'll be turning seven this February 4th. As her birthday approaches, all I can seem to think about is that Ava has now been alive without her dad for more years than the short period of time she was given with him. It's strange some of the milestones I've started to keep. <clears throat> I'm now nearly two years older than my husband, who was born in 1978, three years before I drew my first breath. In 2013 also marks the first year that Tom had been dead longer than we were husband and wife. Um, our marriage was cut short at just three and a half years. Those years, despite the gifts of a devoted partnership and a happy, healthy child, were the harvest of our lives. From the time he returned from Iraq in 2005 to his death in early 2009, I watched Tom lose his health, his career, and worst of all, his dignity as he fought to live with a progressively debilitating illness that the military medical system refused to take seriously. I met Tom in 2004. Um, he was visiting his sister Kate for the weekend in Chicago, where I'm from, and where she had recently moved in with her boyfriend, now her husband Drew, who is one of my oldest and closest friends. Um, Saturday morning, Drew and Kate called and asked me if I felt like grabbing breakfast. I said sure. And no idea that that invitation would change my life. Um, I rushed in late as usual. Those who know me know that I'm always late. Um, so I sat down at the last empty seat at the table. I was being flustered. I was apologetic. I started babbling about something when I noticed a pair of big blue eyes staring at me in amusement. It, Kate had never told me her brother was good looking. Um, then he smiled at me and it was all over. Um, we were together from that day forward. Um, but Tom was set to deploy to Iraq about a month after we met. Um, during that time, I had gotten to know and love Tom's irreverent sense of humor, his big heart and fondness for children and animals, and his complete intolerance for injustice or other BS of any kind, as he would term it. Um, the week before he left for Iraq, I flew down to Camp Lejeune to see him off, and this was the first glimpse I got of Tom as a Marine. Um, Tom was attached to Second Force Reconnaissance and was in the process of completing his recon training to earn a permanent spot in the unit. It was a goal he took very seriously. Um, Tom spends about four hours every day doing PT outside of work to stay in peak condition. Um, I was impressed and also slightly annoyed with his determination and discipline, um, but it was the kind that only comes from doing something you truly love. Uh, though I was constantly worried for Tom's safety while he was in Iraq, I knew he felt a calling to be there, and I understood that being a Marine was an integral part of who he was. Um, so Tom spent the next seven months as a sniper spotter, patrol driver, and admin clerk for Force Recon in Iraq. Um, we spoke on the phone or wrote each other just about every single day. And about two months into his deployment, Tom confessed to me he had been experiencing rectal bleeding and abdominal pain for a couple weeks. Um, I urged him to go talk to the corpsman about his symptoms. And when he did, the corpsman told him it was probably a hemorrhoid. So Tom decided to suck it up and served out the rest of his deployment with distinction despite discomfort and bleeding. In March 2005, he came home and was awarded two medals and was also decorated for valor for his service in Iraq. I look back on our homecoming celebrations with bitter irony. We were all so relieved that Tom had survived the war when in reality his battle was just beginning. Um, Tom's post-deployment physical exam records show high blood pressure, rectal bleeding, and elevated liver enzymes. No follow-up was conducted on the latter two symptoms, but Tom was prescribed a diuretic to treat his hypertension, and he was subsequently medically cleared to go to parachute jump school at Fort Benning, Georgia. 
Um, and at jump school during an early morning run in full gear, Tom suffered a severe heat stroke. His core temperature in the field was 109 degrees. So the doctors could not believe he survived. Um, and though it didn't kill him, the effects of Tom's heat stroke were devastating. He developed severe sleeping problems, and after this, he could never get more than a couple hours of sleep each night. Um, the temperature regulation system inside his brain was permanently damaged. And so his physical training routine that had been so important to him for years had now become exhausting and also potentially dangerous for him. Um, but the worst part was that the heat stroke had made Tom undeployable, which made him ineligible to continue pursuing his career with Force Recon. Although he never broke down, I knew this was a crushing blow for Tom. He was reassigned to a desk job at Marine Corps headquarters in December 2005. By this time, we were married and expecting what we hoped would be the first of many children. We packed up and moved north to Virginia, both trying hard to adjust to the changes life had thrown at us. Tom was still suffering quietly from abdominal pain and rectal bleeding, but I could see it wearing on him. Finally, in October of 2006, I insisted that my husband see a gastroenterologist at Bethesda Naval Hospital. Um, he was sent for a colonoscopy, which had to be continued almost as soon as it began due to severe ulcerations throughout Tom's large intestine. Tom was provisionally diagnosed as having inflammatory bowel disease, possibly Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. Um, he was prescribed medications, including steroids and other immunosuppressants for uh, IBD, which were largely ineffective. Tom's pain, bleeding, and ulcerations continued to come and go with continued frequency. Tom's constellations of symptoms continued to grow. Every few months, another problem would appear. And for each new symptom, at least one new prescription drug was added to Tom's lips, while diagnostic tests between few and, became few and far between. In 2007, um, Tom was first diagnosed with asthma and later severe sleep apnea. Tom also began having debilitating neck and back pain, and he was started on a steady diet of narcotics by his doctor. At first, several tests were scheduled to determine the source of the pain, but when the preliminary results were inconclusive, Tom's doctors basically gave up trying to find a solution. Instead, they just kept increasing the dose of painkiller and other drugs, including several neurological agents, just in case the pain was uh, related to his nervous system. Um, for those of you familiar with medication, which I'm guessing a lot of you may be, um, just for pain, Tom was prescribed up to 15 oxycodone per day, plus Lyrica, Trazodone, and a fentanyl patch. Um, at one point, his doctor told me that he was on as much pain medication as a terminal cancer patient. Um, in 2008, about a year before he died, Tom started swelling up. Um, the edema started in his joints, first his hands, knees, then hips, and finally his face and body. In the course of one month, Tom gained almost 40 pounds. When we reported this to his primary care doctor, he was told he needed to try to lose weight. Between the GI bleeding and intense abdominal discomfort, Tom barely ate to begin with. And the musculoskeletal pain, along with the effects of the heat stroke, made it pretty much impossible for him to exercise. Um, Tom and I were both getting burned out by constant visits to doctors who didn't seem to listen or care about finding out what was happening to him. Um, I realized that I hadn't seen Tom smile, that adorable, mischievous smile that I loved so much in months. He came home dead tired from work every day and spent the majority of nights in the bathroom. Excuse me, it's hard to talk about. Um, I could often hear him moaning in there, but he would never let me inside because he was too embarrassed. He was in pain all the time and never wanted to be touched, which was hurtful and confusing to me at the time. Today, I understand Tom's life had completely changed. A couple years earlier, he used to spend hours in the gym lifting weights. Now he had a hard time picking up and carrying his two-year-old daughter. He hated that he had to ask his wife to do what he considered manly work around the house, taking out the garbage, loading and unloading the car, anything like that. I had to do all the shopping because Tom could no longer walk around the grocery store without stopping several times to rest. I came home from work one day to find my husband crying in the kitchen, and I had never seen him cry. He told me he thought he was dying. Uh, what were supposed to be the best years of our lives had turned into a living nightmare. 
It was at this point I did something which I now regret. I told Tom's doctor that I was worried that Tom was depressed because of all of the stress and pain that his unexplained illness was causing. I regret this only because the minute I mentioned Tom's psychological health, I felt like he was black marked. He was prescribed an antidepressant, a sleep aid, um, and a, another medication uh, that the military had been using widely to treat PTSD. Um, in reality, the medication I found out wasn't even approved to treat that. It was for schizophrenia or bipolar disorder and, and antipsychotic. So three more medications. Um, he was never offered therapy, counseling, anything that we had initially gone in to seek. Um, after this appointment, his primary care doctor diagnosed Tom with somatoform disorder. The diagnosis was not disclosed to Tom at this time, but it was communicated to some of his other physicians. His doctors now had a reason to assume that his as yet unexplained physical symptoms were psychological in origin. This was a perfect solution that allowed the doctors to stop searching for other reasons for Tom's illness and to pass responsibility for getting better onto the patient. Despite this new theory of somatoform disorder, Tom continued to be prescribed very high doses of narcotics and immunosuppressants. In all, Tom was taking over 15 different medications a day, but his, continue, just con his condition just continued to worsen. Tom was medically discharged from the Marine Corps on October 30th, 2008, but continued to receive care from physicians at Bethesda and Walter Reed. Once he was discharged, the standard of care provided continued to decline, in my opinion. During his last three appointments, the final one just days before his death, no one even bothered to take his blood pressure or listen to his heart and lungs. Um, so um, on Valentine's Day of 2009, I got a phone call from my best friend that her mom had passed away in Chicago. So I booked a plane ticket and I was trying to head straight to the airport to be there for her. Um, Tom was not feeling well enough to come along, so he stayed home. I almost left our daughter with him. Um, but he looked too sick to me, so I thought I'd give him a break. Um, he was driving me to the airport, and I noticed he was having trouble breathing, as he often um, did, so it was nothing out of the ordinary, and he had a slight fever. Um, I asked him if he was okay to drive. He said it was fine, and, um, you know, he dropped us off at the airport Valentine's Day, and we flew to Chicago. Um, the next day I talked to him during the week in the afternoon that I was at. He seemed really groggy on the phone, but he said he was feeling better. And so I'm like, all right, I'll just let you go. You know, figured he needed some rest. And that was the last time I ever talked to him. Um, a little more than 12 hours later, um, I had finally been able to get in touch with his brother, Dan. His parents were out of town. He was, Tom was alone at the house. Um, and Dan, went over to the house and found Tom dead in his armchair. But uh, it appeared that he just fell asleep and never woke up. Um, so when the autopsy came back, it revealed that Tom had heart, liver, and kidney disease, um, along with the pneumonia that apparently killed him. And the medical examiner made sure to note that the medications that he was given contributed to the development of pneumonia and his death. I don't know, there's no really good way to end this. I actually didn't even write out an ending to the speech I had so carefully written. Um, that's how Tom's story ended for him. But I'm up here speaking today as everyone else is because like you said, Dan, you can't be silent on this. The military medical system is broken. There is a lot that need to be fixed. People are coming back with problems and we do not know what's wrong with them. And we need doctors that are going to prescribe and manage medications responsibly. And we need doctors that are not going to give up when people have symptoms that don't fit into a neat little diagnostic box that are going to keep looking for solutions and pay attention to some of the people that are talking about different things that could be causing strange, mysterious illnesses. Basically, that's all I have to say. Thank you for being here. Thank you for supporting uh, this cause. And, you know, I just think the more that we talk about this, the more that we get the message out, it's the only way things are going to change. Thank you.